The KB, or dissociation constant, is a measure of binding affinity, and it's equal to the concentration of one binding partner that's required for half of the other binding partner to be bound. But why? Where does this come from? Why should we care? And how can we determine the KB from binding experiments? So we have two binding partners. We'll call them A and B. They can bind and they can unbind. So this is a reversible reaction. And if you let it go long enough, it's going to come to equilibrium. What happens in equilibrium is that the amount that they're binding is equal to the amount that they're I mean, unbinding. And so there's no net change in the proportion of the bound and the unbound. When this happens, we can have this thing called an equilibrium constant. So because this is a reversible interaction, we can define our equilibrium constant in terms of like the forward direction, so binding, in which case we would call it the Ka or the association constant, um, or the reverse direction, so the unbinding, um, so the dissociation. So we talk about a dissociation constant. So we can get this using this thing called the law of mass action, which is basically, it's just saying that for any reaction or for any like interaction that you have at equilibrium, there's going to be this constant value, um, an equilibrium constant, which we represent with a big K. So these little, these little Ks are like rate constants, but these big Ks are like the equilibrium constant. And basically what it's saying is that no matter what concentrations you start with, you're going to end up with this proportional relationship where you're going to have the, um, this constant is going to equal to the, pro the concentration of your um, products times, the, like, times one another divided by the concentration of your reactants. And so it makes more sense if you think about it that way in terms of like the Ka, but we're talking in the reverse direction, remember? So our Kd is going to be equal to our concentration of A times the concentration of B divided by the concentration of AB. So this, is, this comes from that idea. Um, if it was more complicated and you had like stoichiometry stuff. So basically you can, this law of mass action, um, it's like for all like reversible reactions. Um, basically this law of mass action, you can use it for like a bunch of different like reversible reactions. So it's not just for, you can also use it for like things where they're actually like reacting and so you have like products and reactants versus just like binding um but it's really helpful and we can we can now have this idea of this equilibrium constant or the kd so the kd is not telling us about the rates um so we don't know anything about the rates but we do it does tell us about the affinity um so basically affinity is like how tightly something binds so there's this really useful relationship where the KD is, is equal to the concentration of one partner at which half of the other partner is bound. And this is going to allow us to measure the concentration bound over a range of the other partner's concentrations. And this is going to allow us to determine the KD. And the KD is going to tell us about the relative affinity. So the KD is going to be specific for the interaction partners at like a certain temperature and under certain conditions. So like the buffer and stuff is going to matter. It's not going to depend on the concentrations. It's just going to, because you're go, it's, we're talking about this ratio here. So you can start with like different amounts and you will reach the same ratio once you get to equilibrium. But different, um, different like interaction partners will have different KDs. So when you, if you were to go and like look and see how much of this was bound, um, so you let it go to equilibrium and then you were to look at it. Well, how much of it is bound is going to depend on the concentrations of these um, because they have to like bump into each other. But then every time they bump into each other, they can either bind, which we, there's like, this is where the rate constants, like this K on comes in and then they can unbind. So this would be the K off. Now, this is, these are rate constants, they're not the rates. And so what's happening is at the equilibrium, you have equal rates of um, on, of like association and dissociation. Um, but those rates are going to be multiplied by the concentrations of these rate constants get multiplied by these concentrations. And this is why at the equilibrium, you can have the equal rate forward and reverse rates, but you're not have necessarily 
pro you're probably not having equal rate constants. So these are going to stay constant, but your rate is going to change based on the concentration of these. But eventually you will reach an equilibrium. And at this equilibrium, we can say that there's going to be this relationship between the concentrations of the free and the concentrations of the bound. And it has this useful relationship where the KD is equal to the concentration at which half, the concentration of one partner, we'll call it A, at which half of the other partner, so half of B is bound. And so we'll get into why in a minute, but this mean, you this will tell you about the affinity because if you if it takes something's a weaker binder, it's going to take more of that thing for half of it to be bound. So you can imagine that each time it runs into something, it can um, it has you can imagine that you're more likely to be bound if you have a bunch of it because you can like keep running into it even if you don't like it that much. Um, like every time you let go, there's one right there. Whereas if you had a weaker affinity, then it would take a lot more to reach that halfway point. Um, and so something with a weaker affinity is going to have a higher KD. So a higher KD is equal to a lower um, affinity and a lower KD is equal to a higher affinity. So this can be a kind of confusing concept, but it has to do with the fact that we're using a dissociation constant instead of an association constant. So we are looking at the ratio of the unbound times the unbound over the complex as opposed to the complex over the unbound. Um, and so this allows us to use unit of concentration units like molarity, um, micromolar, um, so like molar, micromolar, or nanomolar, picomolar, depending on the affinity. So if you have something that's a really tight affinity, you're going to be talking about like the nanometer range, the picometer range. Um, whereas if you have something with the weaker affinity, now you're going up into the micromolar, millimolar um, range. And so when people are like trying to make drugs and that sort of thing, they want to have a really low KD or else they'd have to give you a ton, a ton, a ton of the drugs and they have to have these, these giant pills. And then you'd probably get a bunch of side, like off effects and that sort of thing. Um, so you don't want that to happen. And so these companies are often trying to figure out, um, do experiments to try to figure out what their KD is. So they know how much they can, they need to give of it. Um, and so that they can maybe um, make modifications and see if they can lower that value. We also, um, in like basic science, we do a lot of these sort of things, well, some of us at least, um, to try to figure out why proteins bind various things, why they don't bind other things. Um, if we make a change to the proteins, does it change its KD? Um, if we make a change to the binding partner, does that change its um, KD? Because the KD, remember, is telling us a bit about affinity. Um, but it's not telling us about um, like the rates. Um, and so because we have this, it doesn't help, like we have these rate constants and there are ways that we can figure out the rates. If we use like a kinetic experiment or using something like um, SPR or ITC, so isothermal calorimetry or surface plasma resonance, um, those sort of things, we can get at rates. With equilibrium, what we're doing is we're not, we don't find out anything about rates. The equilibrium is related to the rate constants um, in that the equilibrium, um, the equilibrium constant is equal to like the, the ratio of the rate constants, um, but we're not going to talk about that because we're talking about, we're looking at equilibrium, and so we can't figure out anything about these rate constants, so we're not even going to try um, because we lose that information when we are just looking at the KD because we've already reached equilibrium and we don't know how fast it, they got there. Um, we don't know if, if something has a lower KD, so it has a higher affinity. We don't mean, know if that's because it has a fast, like a higher um, forward rate constant or um, a lower off rate constant or, um, or a combination of the two. So we can't tell anything about that, but we can tell about affinity. And so how are we going to measure this? Well, we're going to use that relationship between the KD and the, um, the constant, that relationship of the KD is the concentration of B, uh, A, by which half of B is bound, 
or conversely, the concentration of B at which half of A is bound. So we can use either partner, um, but we typically use the one um, based on the experimental constraints that we're changing. Okay, so why is this relationship? Um, so basically the fraction of B that's bound, we can um, represent it with the symbol. That's going to be equal to the amount of bound B divided by the total B. And so our total B is going to be our free B, um, as in the unbound, as not, not as in you get a free B, um, and plus the bound B. So this is going to be our total B. And then our KD, remember, is the concentration of A times the con free A times the concentration of free B divided by the concentration of A times B. And if we do a little math, we can figure out that the concentration of the fraction of B bound is going to be equal to the concentration of A over the concentration of KD plus A. And then when this, um, if A is equal to the KD, so if the concentration of A is equal to the KD, then when you get, if you substitute KD in for A, you get that you have KD divided by KD plus KD, so you have one over two. And so this is how you get that half. So this looks a lot worse than it actually is. Basically here, you just have this fraction where, or where we're taking the fraction. Now we just divide this all by AB. So this is going to cancel out these, but now we have this divided by AB. But if we look over at KD, now we see that this looks kind of like KD, except the KD has an extra A, concentration of A, so we'll just divide that out. Now we can divide everything, now we can multiply everything by A to cancel that A out, and now we're left with the concentration of A over the KD plus A. And this is really powerful because this is saying that all we need to do is measure the fraction of B bound and the concentration of A, and we can figure out the KD. There's a slight concentrate complication in that this is actually the concentration of free A. And we don't really want to have to measure the concentration of free A and the concentration of bound A and um, the concentration of free B and the concentration of bound B. That would be a pain. So instead, we use a simplification. So basically, we can say that, well, if the total B is way, way, way less than the total A, then almost all of the total A, all of, almost all of the A is going to be free A. So we don't need to worry about that. We don't need to worry about this. We'll just, it's like a drop in the bucket that you're taking out. So we'll just say that the concentration of free A is about the concentration of the total A. And so if we know how much total A we put in, then we can simplify this. And we just need to look at the total A. And then for order for this to be true, however, you need to make sure that your total concentration of B is about ten, at least tenfold under the KD. Um, so if you have more of this, if this isn't true, if you don't have a lot more M A than you have A, than you have B, then you're going to be, you're going to need to take that into account that you're depleting your A. You are going to be depleting it. That's going to affect your KD calculations if you're not taking that into account. Okay, so now we just need to set up our experiment. And we'll do, we, typically we do some sort of experiment where we have a constant low amount of a measurable, um, our measurable B. And so typically we often, if we're doing like a protein RNA or protein DNA binding, we'll want to use a low concentration of like the, pro, the DNA or RNA because we can label it. We can use like a radio label or a fluorescent label. And these are really sensitive. And so then we can use a really tiny amount because remember we need to use a small amount to keep it well under the KD. Um, so we go from a high concentration range to a low concentration range or um, just do a serial dilution. And typically we wanna be about like a 100 fold above and below the KD. So you'll typically have to do some like scouting out um, to figure out the optimal range before you do like the final experiments to get the, like the perfect, the actual values. Because we need to have the, like a good range in order to uh, calculate the KD appropriately. So there are different types of experiments that you can do. You can do things like a slot blot, things like an EMSA if you're looking at protein RNA, um, various techniques um, for measuring binders.
Um, but tip, so what you're gonna do is you're going to, so we have like a const, this example, I have a protein and a labeled RNA. I, then you increase your concentration of the A and then measure how much of B is bound. So you just need a way to measure like the proportion of B bound. You know the concentration of A you're putting in. You don't really care about the concentration of B because you have so, so little of it. As long as you have so, so little bit of it, you don't really need to worry about it. As long, and you just need a way to detect how much of it is bound, what fraction of it is bound. So you don't need like absolute numbers, but you need to know the fraction bound to the unbound. Um, so you need some way to like separate the two, um, such as with like a filter binding assay or like where the shift in an M set, that sort of thing. And so then what you do is you increase the concentration. You can see that if you don't have, so when you start, if you have like no, if you have no A, well then you can't have any B bound. And so if you can't have any B bound, then none of it's gonna be bound, you're gonna be down here. If you have a lot, a lot of A, then basically all of the B is going to be bound and you reach this plateau where you can't add any, if you, you can add more and more, but you can't bind any more of the B because we have so much little of the B compared to the A. And at some point there's going to be a halfway where you're halfway to the full B binding. So we could call like the B max where it's like all bound. Um, and then half of that would be the concentration of A at which half of it is bound is going to be your KB. So the B max, um, this can correspond to the like the the concentration that you expect it to be. Sometimes it's a little lower because it's actually it's taking account like the active concentration or whatever. So say you had some like protein that was misfolded or that sort of thing, then it wouldn't be contributing to the actual um, concentration. Um, and when they do this curve fitting, you want to you fit so that the B max is like where you have the plateau. And it's important then you have this wide range of concentrations in order to accurately make sure you're at the plateau. Um, and this is one of the reasons why um, people used to use like scatter plots and stuff, but now we typically do a linear, nonlinear regression, um, more accurate, and you can make sure you reach the plateau. So typically this is graphed instead of like, just as linear scale, it's typically graphed on a log scale because we're doing this, um, the serial dilution. So you're gonna end up with a lot of little points over here and like then points spread out and out and out um, if you were to do it linear. And so we put it on a log scale and then we can more easily see things, um, fit everything on this nice axis. Um, when we do this, then our KD is actually, our we're gonna have an inflection point, um, which is going to happen at our KD where we have this halfway point um, at this concentration. So if something has a higher affinity, then you don't need as much of it in order to be to reach that halfway point and you'll have a lower KD. But if something has a weaker affinity, it's going to have a higher KD because it's going to take more of the A in order for half of B to be bound. So you need more opportunities to run into it um, in order to find it um, more of it, half of it bound when you go and look. It's really important to pay attention to the KD um, because if you go away from the KD, you are going to have uh, not much bound or a lot bound. Um, and so basically when think about the situation where you have tenfold less of the KD. So your concentration of A is 0.1 of your KD. In this case, you only have about 9% of B bound. So just by going tenfold down, now you only have about 9% bound. If you go tenfold above the KD, well, now you have about 90% bound of B bound. And so this is why like drug manufacturers and stuff want to be pay so much attention to this KD and why it's important to consider the KD when you're doing like experiments um, or you're trying to figure out is something realistically bound um, in the cell and that sort of thing. Although that's um, like context dependent because things can be like scaffolded together in a cell. So even if something's at a present at a lower concentration, there are other things that can kind of like help increase the low concentration, like scaffolding proteins that bring together different, um, different binding partners to help out. Um, but you also need to keep into, 
to take into account that basically everything will have some sort of KD. It just might be like ridiculously high. Um, so just because things can bind doesn't mean that they will. And so if something, you might find that something binds, but it has a super, super, super high KD. So it's probably going to be binding to a bunch of other stuff too before it binds that. Um, so KD is something to keep in mind. Um, and yeah.